so complications of diabetes, we can divide it as the acute complications and chronic complications. Acute complications include diabetic ketoacidosis, uh, hyper, uh, uh, hyperglycemic, hyperosmotic uh, state, as well as hypoglycemia. Uh, talking about the chronic complications, we can divide it as macrovascular and microvascular. Microvascular complications include nephropathy, retinopathy, neuropathies, etc. Uh, macrovascular complications include any cardiovascular, cerebrovascular or peripheral vascular diseases. So before we go ahead, I just thought I'll uh, put out this question in the group. So an 18-year-old Sunil has been brought in an ambulance to you with uh, decreased consciousness. So the mother says that he's been sick since two days and he wasn't eating well. He is a diabetic patient. He's on insulin. When you examine him, he's got a dry mouth and he's have a ketotic odor. He's got fever. His heart rate is high. BP is low. GR base is 333. Sodium is 130. Potassium is 6.4. And then in the urine, ketones is positive. What would be your diagnosis? Any answers? Okay, somebody says uh, DKA. Okay. Anybody else? I request all the attendees to post your answers in the chat box of Q&A session. Okay. All right. I think we have a few answers. Everybody is saying it's DKA. All right. So, uh, yeah. So, you're right. This is DKA, diabetic ketoacidosis. So, diabetic ketoacidosis and hyperglycemic hyperosmolar state are quite similar in the sense that both of these are hyperglycemic emergencies. So, but then there are quite a few differences between the two. So, uh, both of them present with hyperglycemia normally in HHS. There will be a very high sugar, like more than 1000, more than 800 and all that. Uh, DK is associated with acidosis. However, in HHS, the pH will be higher than 7.3. There will be ketosis. Uh, ketonemia is there in DK. HHS, there can be a mild ketone positive, but it cannot be there also. Uh, in DK, there can be dehydration, but in HHS, the dehydration is much more prominent. It is very profound. So that is one thing to keep in mind. Normally, DK can affect any age group, mostly young, because it's more common in type 1 diabetes. So it's mostly seen in the younger age group, but it can affect in uh, elderly as well. And uh, it's an acute uh, presentation. Normally, HHS is present presence more in the elderly than in the younger population, mainly because it's more common in patients with type 2 diabetes. Many times, we can also have a patient without a past history of type 2 diabetes. It could be the first presentation that a patient comes with to the hospital as well. So DK is more, more of an acute presentation. HHS is sometimes longer, a slightly more protracted course of the illness will be there. So this is the pathogenesis of how it happens. So uh, there can be an absolute insulin deficiency as it happens in uh, uh, DK, or it could be a relative insulin deficiency, which happens in HHS. So normally what happens is because, uh, because of an absolute uh, insulin deficiency, there will be a lipolysis and this results in uh, ketogenesis and ketoacidosis as well. And uh, it can also result in a hyperlipidemia. Because there's a lower glucose utilization, there will be increased gluconeogenesis, increased glycogenolysis, all of that results in a higher sugar. This can happen in both DK as well as HHS. So um, uh, this results this results in a glycosuria causing an osmotic diuresis. So that's why there's a lot of fluid loss that happens, resulting in a severe dehydration that happens in HHS. So there's a loss of water in electrolytes and it can also result in impaired renal function. So the pathogenesis and pathophysiology of both DK and HSS are connected, but then they're not the same. They're slightly different uh, uh, steps that happens in both of these illnesses. So uh, when do we see DK? So uh, so both DK and HHS usually, you know, if, if there is a non-compliance to medication, basically, or if they're on a lower dose of medication, like if they are not taking adequate amount of insulin, which results in an increased sugars, uncontrolled sugars. Normally, patients who are on insulin pumps have a higher chance of developing it because, they, you know, their insulin will not be adequate sometimes or they won't be compliant with it. 
uh, normally DK can also be the presenting uh, uh, factor. DK and HHS can be, like I said, a presenting factor. If it's a newly diagnosed diabetes or if it's an undetected diabetes, the patient comes to the emergency with these things and then it gets diagnosed as a diabetes. Acute infections can precipitate it. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, there are a lot of things that can precipitate. We call it as a five eyes, which is infection, infarction and all that. So uh, a CVA, MI, uh, things like acute pancreatitis, renal failure, burns. So all of these acute stressors can also uh, precipitate a DK or a HHS. So as part of the treatment of both of this, we need to find out the underlying cause. What was it that precipitated this? And that needs to be also taken care of uh, along with correcting the, uh, the electrolyte imbalances. So trauma, surgery, all of these, and some drugs, especially these antipsychotic drugs like clozapine or lanzapine, all of these can also precipitate a DK or HHS. So normally, how does a patient present? So uh, like you all saw in the example, a patient usually presents with uh, maybe decreased consciousness, confusion. There can be an increased urination. There can be nocturia because of the diuresis. Patient will be feeling very thirsty if they are uh, conscious because of the dehydration. The sugars will be high. They'll be feeling tired. Uh, in DK, there will be a typical fruity odor, the ketotic odor that is there. It can also present with nausea and vomiting, which is more common in DK than in HHS. They can have other symptoms like abdominal pain, rapid breathing, breathing difficulty, all of that can also be there. So when you do a blood test or when you do uh, in the uh, normally such patients will be admitted in the emergency, maybe even shifted to the ICU. So when you do a blood uh, test for them, when you do an ABG for them, normally like the definition says that DKA is a ketoacidosis. So there will be acid acidosis in DKA, but in HHS that does not happen. So these are some of the findings that you can have as you can see in this slide. So uh, normally in a DKA, the pH will be lesser than in a, in a severe, it will be even less than 7. But in a HHS, it will be more around more than 7.2, 7.3. So there, there will be higher sugar levels, like I said, in DK. But in HHS, it will be very high, like more than 600 or 800. You can have a decreased uh, sodium bicarbonate levels. You can have a low or high potassium. So all of these electrolyte imbalances can also happen. So all these things also need to be kept in mind. So how do we manage a DK? Of course, this is a very, I'm just putting this in a nutshell. It, if you have to, uh, if you want to know about it, then you will have to, you know, go more into detail and try and find out what, what exactly you need to do to manage. But this is just putting it in a very broad way that I'm uh, presenting this to you right now. So uh, the first thing is IV fluids because the patient is dehydrated. So normally we give initially over the first one to three hours, we give two to three liters of normal saline. After that, you can reduce it to 0.45% uh, saline, that is half normal saline. And uh, then slowly as the sugar comes down to around 250 or lower than that, you can add a 5% glucose to this as well. And then you can reduce the rate of the drip. Always make sure that if, if the patient is having HHS, make sure that you are treating the... Um, uh, treating the dehydration well before starting an insulin drip. Otherwise, the patient can uh, have, have problems. So uh, the second thing will be insulin drip, like I said. So it's mainly a uh, infusion that is important. We do give a small bolus initially, which is 0 0.1 units per kg. So if the patient is like 50 kg, then you would give five units of a, a short-acting bolus, uh, insulin as a bolus, and then start an infusion. So this would also initially be started at 0 0.1 units per kg per hour and as the sugars come down you'll have to monitor sugars regularly like maybe every half an hour uh, initially and then slowly uh, taper it down and then you can also reduce the rate of infusion to 0 0.5 to 0 0.05 to 0 0.1 units and then slowly you will have to switch over from a short acting insulin to a long acting insulin also you need to monitor the potassium levels like i said so if the potassium is less than 3.3 then you need to stop the insulin infusion first correct the potassium till it sort of becomes more than 3.3 and then you can restart the insulin uh, because insulin is one of the things that is used in treatment of hyperkalemia actually so it causes uh, intramolecular movement of the 
uh, uh, potassium. So if the potassium is 3.3 .3 to 5.2, then uh, you can give 20 to 30 milli, milli equivalents uh, of potassium per hour in one liter of IV fluid. So you have to maintain the potassium level between 4 to 5. If the potassium is more than 5.2, then you don't have to give potassium, obviously. But then you can just keep checking the serum levels every two hours. If it's going down because you're putting the patient on insulin, there's a chance that the patient might develop hypokalemia slowly. So if something like that happens, then you might have to give a potassium supplement as well.